Hi, I'm Ruth Medjver and welcome to Adorama TV. Join me today when I get to speak to one of the world's most well-known astrophotographers, Tom O'Donoghue. We get to look at his work, hear about his techniques and hopefully get some tips and tricks for you. Adorama TV presents Out of the Dark Room with Ruth Medjber. I'm delighted to be sitting here in the Dunsink Observatory and that location can only mean one thing, astrophotography. Joining me today is Tom O'Donoghue. Tom has had some amazing work, exhibitions, he's given talks all about astrophotography. His work has even been showcased by NASA and he himself has even moved country in search of clearer skies. Tom, thanks so much for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here in this observatory. I'm sure you've probably been here before. I have. I've paid a few visits, yes. Thank you. So, tell me, how does one get started in astrophotography? Was it like always a love of photography and then you just looked into the astro side of it or, or how did it happen? Um, I wanted to try something challenging and I've always, always had a love for science and for space and for astronomy. So, I first purchase was a, a Canon DSLR and a barn tracker mount and I attempted to take photos from the suburbs of Dublin. Wow. Um, just trying to take star trails, just trying to be able to focus the camera and um, seeing what kind, of, what kind of stars and what kind of objects would, would, would come through in a 30 second image, which was just a very basic setup. Wow, it sounds basic, but I suppose if you're coming from it from absolutely no knowledge at all, which is what I'd be doing, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it sounds a little bit more trickier, I suppose. Did you have a knowledge of photography first, or did you just jump into this completely? Uh, well, my knowledge from photography came from uh, a school club okay. where um, we used to develop our own pictures and take our own shots. And the astronomy itself came from magazines from the same astronomy club in school, just seeing the colour photographs. Yeah. Um, I just thought they were incredible and someday I wanted to try them. Now, it took 20 years to finally get a telescope and, and to progress into the photography. But starting from your back garden, um, it's a great way to get into the hobby. It's cheap. Uh, the access to um, clear skies weren't that important to me at the start. I didn't understand about light pollution. I didn't understand about um, how a camera will, will pick up the orange lights and what other kind of problems that you will come across that would so lead me to, you were very to venture to dark sides. I was a total amateur, total yeah, novice. You're yes. learning as you go kind of thing. And still am learning, yes. Yeah, yeah. But look at what you can create now. That would be <laughs> fantastic. I'm um, still going, yeah. So explain to me a little bit more about astrophotography because I know there's all sorts of different types. Um, mm. So, so what, what could be an example of them? You do lots of different things from star trails which look very different than your, your, the nebula and everything else that you do. So. Explain to me what the types are, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, astrophotography is such a broad subject. Mm. Um, I mean, astro really means star. So um, we, as astrophotographers, do include items like the moon, the planets, aurora, um, things like moon dogs, moon bows, iridium flares. There, there is a, a huge list of things. Wow. A lot of them are, are phenom weather phenomena. A lot of them are atmospheric phenomena. Um, but really, astrophotography, the simplest ways are uh, wide field star shots, like constellations. You okay. can zoom in and do deep sky photography, like what I, what I do myself. Yeah. You have the moon, the planets, and solar photography, okay. which is another section with a different type of setup. And, um, and then you have kind of high focal length deep sky photography, wow. which is, um, well, just the equipment um, constraints are enormous at that stage. I'd imagine. So it's kind of the deeper you go, the more you see, but obviously the more expensive it gets as it, well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So bring us back then to, to the edge of where we are now. <laughs> And uh, let's, let's take me, for example, I've never done astrophotography before. Mm. I've wanted to, and there's been, there's, there's been nights where I've looked up and I can see the stars so clearly. Okay. What am I going to do? Can you tell me how I would set up my DSLR and my kit lens to get that? Okay. Well, the, the simplest start is what we call star trails, where, where you get a static tripod okay. and you'll open your shutter on manual or bulb mode for 30 seconds. Okay. And um, the focal length, the lower the better, but if you live near near lights, um, you will probably get a little bit of uh, light pollution. But a simplest shot, open your aperture for the 30 seconds, pointing it north, if you live in the northern hemisphere, towards Polaris, and you'll notice the whole Earth will rotate in that 30 seconds around the North Star. And you'll have so, your first star trail. So you get this fabulous shot where you can still see the landscape in some shots, and then you yeah. get the trails. Exactly. I mean, depending on, on how wide open yeah, your lens is, yeah. sorry, the focal length of yeah. your lens. But it's always nice, I think, to give a little bit of depth to it with the foreground objects, trees, people, yeah. um, some, some landscape, and, and the night sky. 
let's take it a step further, okay? Say I've managed to, to, to do all that. So what would be next? How do I compensate then for the, for the trails? Because you know when you get shots and they're pinpoint and the stars are gorgeous and you can see everything so clearly. Okay. Talk me through that. Um, so when you see the final shot, you mightn't realize what all the equipment that will go into um, some shots where the stars remain pinpoint. Okay. Most of, of the higher end, the, the deep sky shots are taken on motorized mounts. So the idea is to counteract the rotation of, of the earth. Okay. So as you notice, the stars, the moons will, will come up in the east and will move across to the west. Yeah. So your mount will counteract that and will, will drive against the rotation to keep everything in a static position. Okay, so and that's a motorized the next step. mount. <laughs> a motorized mount. Okay. Now they, they, can, they come in basic forms. Um, there's a lot of um, astro astronomy shops are now bringing out versions for DSLRs, for uh, Manfrotto type um, yeah. tripods, which will attach on just like your regular camera head okay. and will effectively act as a wedge to elevate your whole tripod axis to whatever latitude you're on. So here, here in, in Dunsink, we're at about 53 degrees. Okay. You will attach this, this wedge drive. It will elevate the, the mount to 53 degrees, and you're then only on one axis. Okay. So you can then use a simplized mount to drive across the sky when, once you've selected your target. And that will allow you to do, um, with the cable release, long exposures, capture more objects, and will also then introduce you to the world of stacking and um, uh, signal to noise. Okay, issues. so that's okay. So we've done this. We've we've tracked, say, mm -hmm. stars, and right. we want them to be pinpoint. So we've put it on this mount that counteracts and it drives the other way around. Am I getting this right? That's correct. Okay, so now I've got my pictures of the stars. Noise. That's what you're saying because I'm open at a thirty second exposure or however long this is open for. Yeah. Um, surely my camera is going to be quite noisy. It will. I mean, for shots like the moon, which would be a, st a single static shot, a good low uh, ISO 100, 200 is in fact really 100 is, is what you're looking for. Really? If you're only shooting 30 second shots, I would say increase the ISO to 1600 and okay. enable the, uh, the noise reduction yeah. in, in your camera settings. Okay. Now what that will do is if you take a 30 second shot, it will take another 30 second shot, it'll leave the shutter closed and subtract that from your initial 30 second image and you get a resultant your image minus the 30 second noise reduction and it cleans it up it removes dark pixels hot pixels yeah. um just gives a smoother cleaner image a cleaner image so that's if you're going for 30 second shots if you are on a motorized mount mm -hmm. and you're taking five 10 minute exposures it's very very time consuming and there are better ways to do it i would say turn off the noise sorry leave on the noise reduction i would say turn off the um the dark frame sub subtraction wow yeah. tell me about say these images here for example mm -hmm. how much work will go into them uh, well, for the first, um, the first shot of, of Orion, this yeah. is my first ever proper mosaic. Okay. I started in January and I had finished taking the shots over 25 nights. Uh, I think and where were you when you were shooting this? At this stage, I had mo moved to Spain to, okay. to, to continue the photography. Ideally for four months and I ended up staying for three years. <laughs> so the reason I'd taken on the Orion project was because I realized I wasn't going to go home. I was enjoying it too much. Okay. And I decided I'm going to try something difficult, proper project shot and see how long it takes me. So th three months of shooting, and because it was my first attempt, six months on the laptop to put it together. Three months shooting, six months post-production putting mm. it together. Unfortunately, I had to start again and again, because I, it was self-taught. Yeah. Um, you, you, know, you build on what other people learned before you. I wasn't reinventing anything, but I needed to learn Just the techniques it, yeah. and try different methods. Each okay. photograph is different, you have to deal with it differently. So if you did 25 nights shooting, mm -hmm. how long are you standing out there for shooting this? Um, well, I like to be at the telescope. I don't have automated focusers. Okay. So in that sense, I'm old school. I will stand and watch virtually every single frame come off. Um, you've got to be rootless when you're talking about the pinpoint stars. Any aberration such as a gust of wind, a cloud passing, will effectively soften your picture or give you a bad signal. I'll throw it in the bin. I don't mind, I'll stay up a little bit later, it, it's fine. So other than going into the house to warm myself to get a cup of coffee. You stay there. I'm staying there wa watching it, yeah. Is that how you get such like detail in your exposures? Or how does that come <laughs> about? Because I'm looking at these images and there's so much going on in them mm. that I, I have no idea how, because if I was to point a camera up there, even with all the equipment in the world, I'd just come back with white light. So how does that happen? How do you get that detail? Well, I, originally the trip to Spain was to go for the, the dark side. So I, I'd gone out there on a little recce, found an ideal spot in the middle of nowhere and thought, okay, I'll, I'll rent here. So I knew it was a dark sky and I even had instruments to measure the light and, and the, dark, the background darkness. So I knew, I knew that was going to be no problem. 
Next after that, it was setting up the equipment. Focusing is critical. Um, I use, as I said, I was doing it by hand, but going through each subframe, throwing out the ones that you're not happy with and stacking your final images to get, yeah. well, for example, just a black and white stacked image. From there on the post-processing, you can sharpen them, um, but it, I like to be subtle. I don't like to over-process. Okay. I don't like noise in the background image, so I'd rather go for more data rather right. than pushing the processing too much. But it's, it's, you've got to be careful, you've got to be patient, and you've got to be ruthless. This is Ruth Mejbeh for Adorama TV. Don't forget to check out Adorama's latest contest online for your chance to win some amazing prizes. So obviously then, these kind of shots that you're doing that you've set up in Spain and you're, you're spending months and months and months preparing, mm -hmm. they're not on a DSLR, are they? Uh, no, we, you can do this with, with a DSLR, but the CCD cameras that I use are generally more sensitive and you can cool those. So the, ah. the biggest thing to, with the signal to noise ratio is a cooled camera or cooled chip gives you a lower noise value. Okay. Now, I, I know a lot of DSLR photographers who will encase their camera in a lunchbox of ice. <laughs> they will cut a little hole and it's, it's literally, it's like the underwater camera covers that, that you get uh, now. Okay, yeah. Fill it with ice and I just have holes for the cables to come out and to try and cool the chip down. That's a fantastic um, tip. It, it's a great way to do things. Other it might void your warranty, but you know. Oh yeah, definitely, because other people take off the back and put a thermoelectric cooler on it. It's gone, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I don't yeah. know even if you can use them for daytime photography anymore. No, probably not. So you're, mm. you just recommend literally cooling down the camera then, so mm -hmm. ice and kind of obviously just stick some fans on it. Ice packs, maybe, not, not I, so much ice. Ice, yeah, <laughs> not in a bucket of ice then. Right. So tell us a bit about the CCD cameras then. Um, how do they differ from DSLR? Um, CMOS chips are generally what you get in DSLR, mm -hmm. CCD are the, literally the CCD chips. Okay. Um, I won't go into the manufacturing, sure. but they, um, they generally have a lower noise threshold, they're more sensitive. Okay. And uh, with the camera themselves, you'll find there's no lens that, that comes with them, there's no buttons on the back. Yeah. There's no interaction with it whatsoever, you need to control it with a, a laptop or a PC. Yeah, and it's fed kind of straight out. Then, it's, fed, I mean, it's got a power cable, a USB cable, and then there may be an option to water cool to even further drop the, the temperature of it. But it is just a chunk of electronics and, yeah. and a chip. And would you recommend that then for um, you know, a photographer who's, who's, who's worked primarily with DSLR, has gotten really into the astrophotography, would you say that's a little step up then? Uh, as far as quality goes, it was the, it's the biggest step up I've made. I think what I'd have to say is the difference between my DSLR, the Canon 350 I originally started with, yeah. and going to a small chip CCD. The, um, the signal was better, the, sharp, the focusing was a lot sharper. Now the problem is that cost-wise, the DSLR chip and what you get um, in the same say, price range for CCD yeah. is a much smaller chip. Okay. So you effectively end up with a lot smaller field of view. Oh, right. So with a 35mm camera that you might see on any of the full-frame Canon or, or Nikons, yeah. for that price range, you might only get a 7 to 10, 12 mil. Wow. Uh, version in, in CCD. Now the prices are they're getting more mm. more comparable to each other, but that was the original I issue. You know, vast yeah. expense for the amount of, as you say, real estate on the yeah. chip. But I suppose you're you're attaching it to a scope, so all that's going to come into effect, and you're going to be thinking about all that down the it line. Is, as it is. Well. It's very very hard to find an object, <laughs> even if it's as big as the moon, when you've got a small chip. Yeah. You're, you're trying to line it up by eye. But I, so I would say the DSLR people have a great advantage with that. Really? Full, full frame, nice wide open sky. Okay. So it's, um, I'd say until you're very happy or you're, you're, you're um, kind of well, well versed in and it, proficient yeah. in, your, in your processing, I would say then move up to CCD. Um, otherwise, if you're on, on your D DSLR, the fact that you can focus it, the fact that you can download the images and process them, it's a fantastic start. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, even a lot of the CCD cameras, um, I was looking at myself, and mm -hmm. there's two different versions. There's colour and monochrome. What yeah. do you shoot when you're, when you're out, you know, photographing Orion in, in you know, Spain's backyard? Are you shooting in colour or are you shooting monochrome? Uh, I shoot in monochrome. Okay, and how does that work then? How do you get these such vivid colours? Um, I use a filter wheel in front of the, the monochrome chip. So the filter wheel goes in between the camera and, and the telescope. And you can control it again with a hand paddle, so you can just flick a switch and it'll rotate to the next filter, or you can control it with the, your laptop. And I'll generally shoot through red, green, and blue filters. And there's, there's one or two extra, um, what we call narrow band filters to, to capture some extra chemistry going on in the sky. But it is all red, all green, all blue, and you stack those together to get master red, green, and blue. You stack that to get a full color image. And then you blend that with the clear filter, which is just the black and white image. 
Again, so much post-production. Uh, massive amounts of post-production. I mean, the whole idea is that you set up your equipment, mm. which maybe takes 20% actually getting everything ready. Yeah. You spend another few days, hours. I mean, you can take a photo in one night, but the next section is actually gathering the data. Then you have to calibrate the data. The 60 hours that are in that image or the 56 hours, yeah. I would normally spend that on, on the laptop again. Wow. So there's an so awful lot of work. It's massive. Yeah. yeah. You seem yeah. to have a lot of patience to do this. And Absolutely. A lot yes. of dedication. So how do you, you, you call it the Orion project because it's taken such a chunk of your time. How do you, how do you just pick something? Do you just, you know, look through some books and go, okay, I want to do this next. I want to do this.